a blessed new moon, blessed fourth month, month of Tammuz, and that's a biblical name in the Bible. And we have this as a fourth month. Well, it is on the 30th today, 30th of June. So you see, if you go by the calendar in the Bible, you don't get it wrong. I want to welcome you all from different countries, different walks of life, as we continue to study present truth. And our topic continues with the new covenant. As we saw how the old covenant and the new covenant are so linked together. In our previous studies, we saw the old covenant which was given to Israel, it was established to Israel. And also we saw how God in the Gentile world will adopt a new type set of Israel. Because the name Israel does not belong to a people, it belongs to God. So that's why Romans chapter 9 Verse 4, it says, we are adopted into being called the children of God. And we're told that once we are Christians, we are Abraham's seed. So now we want to understand more about this new covenant. How it is, how are we in it? Most people are saying they are in the new covenant. When they believe it started, we saw it was started by Christ himself. When he introduced the cup of blessing the cup of his own blood in the first Lord's Supper. And he says, receive, receive ye the cup of the New Testament. And this is the cup of the New Covenant. So if you haven't been taking the Lord's Supper in proper time, you have not started the New Covenant. It started by the cup of blessing of God's really blood from his son. And we know in the, in the Old Testament, the blood was from the bulls. But in the New Testament, the blood is from Christ himself when he died on the cross, which we continue to take in the appointed times. So if you are not taking that blood in the appointed times, you haven't started the new covenant. So here, we want to understand more about it in the new covenant. It's going to usher in the kingdom. Do you see that? So, let's take uh, from book one of Selected Messages, page 232. Let's hear what Sister White says there, so we can understand more about this new covenant. <laughs> Christ taught the gospel plan to Moses while in Mount Sinai, and the glory of the gospel through Christ illuminated the countenance of Moses so that the people could not look upon it. So... Christ taught the gospel plan to Moses, which was the Old Testament. But we want to see that plan coming also into our time. In the Old Testament, the plan of salvation was introduced to Moses. And it says, while in Mount Sinai. And the glory of the gospel through Christ illuminated the countenance of Moses so that the people could not look upon it. So what is it that was given to Moses that caused Moses to be illuminated? It was the gospel. So we saw in, in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 13, we saw what Moses was given on Mount Sinai. And that whole law of four laws, let's read, it caused Moses' face to shine. Right, let's read from Nehemiah 9, verse 13. Yeah. Thou camest down, also upon Mount Sinai, mm -hmm. and spake us with them from heaven, and gave us them right judgments, mm -hmm. and true laws, mm -hmm. good statutes, mm -hmm. and commandments. So we see these laws being given in our time through the prophet Elijah of our time. We will be given in Malachi chapter 4, verse 4 to 5, the same laws, let's hear, let's hear God talking about the same laws that illuminated Moses were being now given to Elijah the prophet in our time. Let's hear in Malachi chapter 4, verse 4 to 5. Yeah? Remember ye the law of Moses, my right. servant, you see, which God I commanded. You by saying, remember that law which, he, which illuminated Moses' countenance. 
mm. or the Moses face. The face was so bright that nobody was able to see Moses' face. So now what t tells us, remember that very law on Mount Sinai, which I gave in Horeb, Horeb in Mount Sinai to say. So that law which caused Moses' face to shine, what does he say about it in, in the verse? Yeah. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, mm -hmm. which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, mm -hmm. with the statutes and the judgments. So the same law which was given Moses, God is saying, remember that law. So what does it mean when we should remember that law? What, what is he going to do with it? Next verse. Behold, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet mm -hmm. before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Right. So we are told the same law which made Moses' face brighten on Mount Sinai is going to be given by the prophet of the hour. I don't know those who don't believe there is a prophet, but we know the prophet brings the same law which was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, which caused Moses' face to shine. It brightens your Christian life. It brightens your life. It gives you more peace. We want to study more about this law coming in the new covenant because we're told the new covenant, the only difference with the old is that the new has got laws written in the heart instead of the table of stones, instead of the precepts outside in the book, but they should be found in the heart. Now, let us read. It says, that same law which illuminated the countenance of Moses so that the people could not look upon it. That law was called gospel. Did you see? But there is a particular law in the four laws which is called gospel. So we have seen which laws came on Mount Sinai. One, the statutes, the judgments, the commandments, and the two laws, which are the testimonies. But which one in particular is named Gospel, we will find it in CCH, uh, page 90, Council for the Church, which is CCH, page 90.3. We want to know which law, actually, of the four laws is called gospel. Without that law, you have no gospel. Let's hear, let's hear more. <laughs> the gospel mm -hmm. is given in precept in Leviticus. That's where it is found. You know, the Ten Commandments is they are found in Exodus chapter 20. But there is a law found in Leviticus chapter 23. You will find that law are the festivals or the statutes. So the very statutes or the festivals that were trampled about in the dark ages by the beast in the time of the Christian era, the festivals which were trampled. Why would the devil trample those? Because today, you are saying it's the first day of the month, of the fourth month in heaven. But what is the law, the, the calendar which was given in that time in the Dark Ages? It's saying it's 30 today of June. So you see, what was the reason for giving those uh, 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 alternate dates? It was to make you confused as to the plan of salvation. But now we are told that these laws in Leviticus have got the plan of salvation. So without them, you don't have the gospel. You don't have the plan of salvation. Because the t Ten Commandments really are not the gospel. The Ten Commandments are directions for you to follow while you live, while you keep the gospel. So the gospel actually is in Leviticus chapter 23. All these festivals are called gospel. Did you understand? Now here we are told, Christ taught the gospel plan to Moses. That's why even Paul, when he was teaching the Gentiles, he told us that he's not ashamed of the gospel. Now you understand what he was talking about. He was not talking about any other law except the festivals. That's why Paul will continuously go and keep all those say, festivals in Jerusalem. He was going, I, was, I must go by all means to Jerusalem from Ephesus. Well, he was not ashamed of the gospel. So which particular law is termed the gospel? It says it's clearly labeled in the book of Leviticus. It's not in Exodus. It's in the book of Leviticus. Sister White confirms it in CCH 90.3.
Now let's hear more about this gospel. It came and most people directed this festival and say they are Jewish. They are from the tribe, I mean the, the, the 12 tribes of, of, of Israel which are, you know, supposed to keep this. But let me see, are they really Jewish? Where are, who gave the Jews that law? Let's hear. Now I want to, to go to the book one again of selected messages. Page 233.2. What we find out, uh, because we will find even from the same verses there, from the same paragraphs, they were now talking about uh, uh, A.T. Jones and Wapuna bringing that law of the gospel soon after the uh, foundation of the Sabbath keepers in 1888. God sent these two men to introduce the gospel, which is the festivals. Now, let's hear in, in that quotation, Selected Messages, Volume 1, Book 1, page 233, where it says Christ was. Christ mm -hmm. was the foundation of the whole Jewish economy. Whose law was it called? The, the author of that law is Christ. So when you reject that law, you're rejecting Christ. Because here, the first paragraph of Selected uh, Messages, in book 1, page 232, clearly says Christ taught this gospel to Moses. So who was the author of the law? It's not Moses. It's not the people who are keeping it, the festivals. It's God himself. Christ taught this law on Mount Sinai. So here we are told this was the main aim of taking the Israelites out of Egypt to be taught about this gospel. That's why when they walked out, Pharaoh was clearly told, release them and let them go and worship God properly. How, was they, how were they going to worship God properly? By keeping the gospel. The gospel, which gospel? The festivals. So that's why Pharaoh was debating with Moses and they spent much time until God gave 10 plagues. 10 plagues to the whole uh, land of Egypt in that time when Moses was pleading for the children of Israel to be released so that they now start serving God properly by, keep, by, keeping, by keeping this gospel. Yeah. So now we are told this gospel was coming right from the hand of God. Christ was the foundation of the whole Jewish economy. Do you understand? Now, let's, let's read more on that paragraph. Uh -huh. The death of Abel was in consequence of Cain's refusing to accept God's plan in the school of obedience. So, why, why did, what is it that um, Cain fell upon? Because Cain did not worship God properly. Abel did. It was the very plan of salvation. What God instructed Cain to bring on the altar is not what he brought on the altar. He brought pumpkins and all these things coming from the farms. But Abel brought a lamb which pointed to the death of Christ on the Passover. So it was in accordance with what should be presented uh, as while well, they were keeping these festivals. So this is what uh, Cain felt failed to follow. And the same, similarly, those who are failing to follow the festivals, as God is pronouncing them through A.T. John's first they rejected them. And now it's coming at last in the sinning program, and they are still rejecting them. They are already acting like Cain. Because Cain refused the gospel plan. Now here we are told the death of Abel was in consequence of Cain's Cain's refusal to accept the cause, uh, God's plan in the school of obedience to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, typified by the sacrificial offerings pointing to Christ. Now we are no longer taking, uh, killing the lambs. What are we doing? We are still taking the bread and wine in the times when the lamb was killed. So we all have a part to play for the plan of salvation. Those in the old and in the New Testament, they have a plan to play in the plan of salvation. They need, those in the old, they were killing these lambs in these festivals. And also those who, who live after the cross, 
they, instead of killing the lamb, they take the bread and wine in the time of the festivals. So that's the gospel plan which God has given the Old Testament people and the New Testament people. And this is what I said started with Christ offering his own blood in typified by the wine and say, receive that cup of blessing of the New Testament. So this New Testament cannot be having the new covenant without this blood of Christ which comes as wine. Now, yeah, let's read more from there. Cain refused. Cain refused the shedding of blood which symbolized the blood of Christ to be shed for the world. Right. So when you are rejecting the festivals, where we will have these emblems, the bread and wine, we are exactly acting like Cain. Because Cain rejected that. This is what caused Cain to be rejected. Cain did not reject the Ten Commandments. You should know that. He did not reject any other laws of the four laws. The law that was transgressed by Cain is the law of the gospel, which are the statutes, the festivals. So those who are rejecting the festivals, they also are rejecting the statutes in Leviticus. They are together with Cain. If they do not repent, they will die together with Cain. This is as simple as that. And then this year, this whole ceremony. Mm -hmm. This whole ceremony mm -hmm. was prepared by God. Right. And Christ became the foundation of the whole system. This whole ceremony of keeping the festivals is a clear preparation coming from above prepared by God and is clearly prepared by God and Christ became the foundation of this ceremony. So when you are rejecting the festivals, you are rejecting a clear preparation by God of the plan of salvation. And when you, the devil obviously will not allow you. Yeah, that's why he set aside the times. He changed these times. Why? Why, 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 why would he change the times and change anything else? It's on the times. The time and laws. Why will you temper with it in the dark ages? Why? Because that's where your plan of salvation lies. So when God is bringing this back, he's making sure those who are going to be sealed will get the whole gospel and be sealed and be ready to live with the angels in heaven and the whole population in heaven have got this plan from God and they follow it. This is because how, why would God concentrate on asking, receiving the plan of salvation. And why would the devil, through the beast in the dark ages, eradicate these times and laws? Because that's where lies your salvation. That's why in Matthew chapter 20, Christ clearly said when in verse 3 that when they were asking, what are the signs for you, for your coming? He clearly said, beware that no one deceives you. Why? How, how is this deception? By eradicating the gospel, making you put on all the uniforms and going to church, pious as you think you are, but without the gospel. This is what the devil wants. So everyone, that's why we saw in Isaiah chapter 4, that seven women are eating their own bread, wearing their own apparel. They don't have the gospel. If they have these festivals, and the, the Ten Commandments and the festivals, which are the statutes, coming from Mount Sinai, as they did come to the Israel of old, then you are not eating your own bread. You are only eating your own bread if your syllabus, if your doctrines in your church do not have the gospel which came from Mount Sinai. It's not only the Ten, ten Commandments which came from Mount Sinai. It's all the festivals also, the statutes, the judgments, all the laws. It's not only one law. So if you unite, it's so easy to unite and worship nothing. You understand? But that's why it says the way to worship God is only a narrow way because the broad way where people just unite and worship nothing is plenty. It's broad. Plenty people are there. But in the road to worship God, 
the way is very narrow. Why? Because it's what the gospel plan. The gospel plan has a lot to do with your commitment. Without that commitment, you cannot meet God. You need to worship God properly with the proper commitment in the gospel which was taught to Moses clearly 40 days, 40 nights. It was not just for the Israel of old. God knew it through for the whole universe which is going to worship God. They need that syllabus properly taught to Moses. This is what we are there. The new covenant should have the same laws. Which laws? The same laws which are given to Moses. Now in the new covenant, they should come with Elijah, who has been promised in Malachi 4, verse 4 to 5. Behold, I will send Elijah. With what? Remember that law of the statutes and judgments is coming back for those who want to worship God fully in the way he has designed in the gospel. Do you understand? Now here, read on and finish that paragraph. We are talking about the covenant, the new covenant. The, the covenant which has the same laws which are given to, to Moses on Mount Sinai. And we continue under the gospel under Elijah. The new prophet of the hour will meet Christ without testing them. Now, read on this here. Mm -hmm. This is the beginning of its work as the schoolmaster to bring sinful human agents to a consideration of Christ the foundation of the whole Jewish economy. That's what A.T. Jones and Wakona brought. The schoolmaster, which should give us righteousness by faith, righteousness in Christ, which will complete our history of a righteousness, of attaining righteousness. So this, you cannot talk about righteousness without the gospel. You need the gospel, the festivals, so that you attain the whole righteousness. And this is what God attempted to bring those two guys in 1888, which were terribly rejected. If you go through those paragraphs where we are reading in Book 1, Selected Messages, page 233, you see how they were adamantly, you know, rejected by the church in 1888. They were rejected. God wanted us to catch on to the gospel. And Sister Wan says, if we did, the church was, the world was supposed to have only two years. And then after two years, Christ was going to come. So it's us delaying Christ by rejecting the gospel. So far, all this time, we are just walking about without the gospel until his patience uh, come to an end. When only the 1.4 thousand are sealed and they stand in Mount Zion to put this plan of salvation again to the Gentiles. The profession of the church will be long closed. Now, let's hear, let's hear more about this one. It's, it's very interesting, isn't it? Um, go to Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 24. When now we receive this full gospel of the statutes and judgments in the new covenant, read, Ezekiel is still talking about this new covenant. Yeah? Mm -hmm. How is it going to be put into our system? Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 24, there. Uh -huh. For I will take you from among the heathen right. and gather you out of all countries mm -hmm. and will bring you into your own land. How is it that people who are now taking the, the wine, the cup of blessing which was given in the appointed times, they are taking, as it was done by early Christians, they were taking at the third hour on the day of Pentecost and we saw the, the former rain camp. How is it that those people who are now in this gospel, keeping the festivals accordingly, keeping the new moon accordingly, how is it that we now find them going three times a year to worship Christ, to worship God, according to what God has designed? The early Christians were doing the same thing. How is it? Now, we are, we are, we are saying we are now able, God is now able to take us to worship him in accordance to the word of God. Once you agree to take the gospel plan and the gospel in the Leviticus, then we see you struggling to say, I need, I must by all means, like Paul said, worship God at the Passover, 
at the Pentecost, at the Feast of Tabernacles, in the right place as the, the disciples were doing. Why? Because the verse says in Ezekiel chapter 36, I will take you from among the heathens and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Do you believe in that, in that verse? It's not coming from, from, from anybody except God. Do you believe that this, there is a plan of salvation where when we agree to believe in the gospel of Leviticus, Christ clearly says, now he will take us out of the heathen and make us worship him three times a year. And finally, will take us where we don't come back when we are in the kingdom. That's when now he gives us the lettering. But let's hear more. <laughs> let's read it. When he has taken us, what happens? <laughs> then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, mm -hmm. and ye shall be clean mm -hmm. from all your filthiness mm -hmm. and from all your idols. Mm -hmm. Will I cleanse you? Right. So only when you adopt the gospel, which Christ has, has promised, that when we adopt this gospel, as in Leviticus 23, then three times a year, we should go and receive the doctrine. First, the doctrine, the letter in, it comes in doctrine. Yeah, that's the letter that we are receiving. And then finally on the day of Pentecost, we stand with Christ on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Right, so here let's hear more. Uh -huh. Verse 26. A new heart then also. God is busy giving us a new heart. Right, listen to the new heart. Wait, what are the principles of the new heart? Let's hear. A new heart, a new heart also will I give you. Mm -hmm. And a new spirit will I put within we you. We have now, we develop what is called a new heart. The stony heart is out. It comes without, with, with not keeping the festival. If you don't keep the festival, you are still under the stony heart. But when you now uh, receive the gospel, and on the Passover, on the Pentecost, on the Tabernacle, there is a heart operation that God is doing in your heart. To change it from being hard to being soft. And then also gives you a new spirit. That's why the spirit now you adopt is no longer the spirit that was there when you are not keeping the feast. Because we see when you are not keeping the feast, God's feast, you are automatically with another spirit which also comes with those who are keeping the pagan feast. Pagan feast has got its own spirit. God's feast has got its own spirit. So when we are now agreeing to have this heart operation in the new covenant where God says, when he takes us, when we go three times a year, what is he doing to the heart? He's making a heart operation and making you have a new spirit. That that spirit, what does it cause you to do? Read, read one lesson. Mm -hmm. And I will put my spirit within you mm -hmm. and cause you to walk in my statutes. Right. Then it's easy for you to when this new spirit is there. The festivals are easily kept. Yeah. We are being a Thursday today. Yeah. Is it a Thursday today? It's a Thursday. Mm -hmm. But it's a Sabbath. It's not very hard to the people who have had a heart operation. They know automatically it's auto. You find them, they're there keeping the feast. But when those who do not have that heart operation, they are calling it a good day of work, a good day of anything. That's why God says, when I now take you out of the heathenism that you are, before you are keeping the feast, you are heathen. You are foreign to the spirit of God. He now makes a heart operation. When you keep the feast, he gives you a spirit, a new spirit, and a new heart, which is soft to the keeping of the festival or the statutes. Then you enjoy keeping these statutes. Listen to that. Mm -hmm. A new heart. Repeat that. Mm -hmm. And verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, mm -hmm. and a new spirit will I put within you. Mm -hmm. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, mm -hmm. and I will give you a heart of flesh. Right. Are you, are you waiting for the time... When Christ shall come, so that you have a, a translation or a new heart. 
No, it happens before it comes. When you are now keeping all the gospel laws, which are the festivals, and the commandments, and the judgments, under which God has promised that he will send Elijah to preach those, so that we, after that, when Elijah has done that job in Malachi chapter 4, now verse 6, he says, I will turn your hearts to the fathers, and the, fa the hearts of the fathers to the children. Why? There is this heart operation which God has done in the heart. So that the festivals are very easy to keep. When you want to keep them, just like it was with Paul, with the disciples, I must by all means keep this festival when which cometh. And this is the heart operation God is now busy doing. So that when he says in in you go to the verse in Zechariah 14, verse 16, when he when he proclaimed that. In, in, especially in verse 17, that's what I want, verse 17. When he proclaims that verse, you understand what he means. Listen to that. Uh -huh. Verse 17. And it shall, and it shall be mm -hmm. that whoso will not come up of the families of the earth mm -hmm. unto Jerusalem, Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Right. So this spirit will never be put on anyone who does not keep these gospel feasts. Because that's the gospel. So you don't have the gospel, you don't have the spirit. You don't have the, the, the rain. And whoever shall not come to worship in Jerusalem and keep this feast shall have no rain. This is what God is saying in the new covenant. He operates the heart and makes the heart soft so that you can keep the feast and also introduces a new spirit takes away the hard heart outside and this its spirit outside that you cannot be fooled by anyone who introduces pack and feast to you no one will be fool you you will know even when you say today is the 30th you know it's one in heaven you will know in heaven today the date is one of the month of Tammuz. Yeah, that name, yes, we know that name was being used by another um, another client, which we know we introduced Christmas, which is called Tammuz. But how many children do you have who are called by the calendar names? Yeah, the calendar was there. It proved that the calendar was there. We have people called January. We have people called May. We have people called June. But does it, but it, does it change the calendar? It doesn't. So God's calendar is called Tammuz. I saw someone say, oh, why is God's calendar called Tammuz? Yeah, but what about June or August? We have people, August, November, December. They are taking the name to show that there is a calendar. So now, if another child was born in the time of the biblical, in the Old Testament, and was called Tammuz, we are taking the name from the calendar of God. So it does not change the calendar. The calendar remains there. If, if, even if you take the name of the calendar, of the calendar month, it does not change the calendar. So you, if you hear the ringing of Tammuz and you are worried about the ringing of the name Tammuz, but you are not worried about the ringing of, ringing of the name June or October or what, you know definitely someone adopted that name of the calendar, of the calendar month and gave his child who's called Tammuz. So it doesn't change anything. It actually should make sure, make you so, you know, confident knowing that definitely they were the calendar. And that's why Semiramis copied and took Tammuz, Tammuz's name from the calendar and gave the name to, his, to her own child, who now people are worshipping all over the world, saying the, the, that child was born on, born on Christmas. So, you know, there's no argument there. There's no argument. It only proves the name was taken from the calendar. So here we have got today being the first day of Tammuz. That's, that one is found in the Bible. The name is found in the Bible. And here, let, let's hear, and a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the story, the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. You see, when you are in the gospel plan, that's where the heart cooperation occurs. 
Don't tell me you're in the new covenant when you have nothing to do with the gospel plan, when you have nothing to do with the festivals, nothing to do with the statutes. What it clearly says, when the new heart has been changed, the heart has been now soft, and the new spirit, in verse 27, what does God say? Verse 27. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That's right. And I will put my spirit within you. Right. And cause you to walk in my statutes. Right. So if you are saying you are in the new covenant, we will check if you have the statutes. If you don't have the statutes, you are just fooling yourself. Because the new covenant comes when God makes a heart operation in the heart. And you change and you are given the spirit to keep, to keep the festivals or the statutes. If you, there is nothing like that, then you have... You are, you are just fooling yourself that you have a new heart. The new heart is, is associated with God's law. The statutes, the judgments, the commandments, all are imputed in the heart as a heart operation. Now it says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Listen to what happens. Mm -hmm. And and I will cause you to walk in my statutes, mm -hmm. and ye shall keep my judgments and mm -hmm. do them. Right. So you see, who has been brought with a syllabus of statutes and judgments? Malachi 4, verse 4. Remember ye the law that I gave with the statutes and judgments. I will send Elijah. So we know, definitely, you are in Elijah's syllabus. So, so many people are claiming they are Elijah. They are Elijah everywhere. They are saying they are Elijah, Elijah, but they don't have the syllabus. So the devil, we know, is also introducing his own Elijahs without the proper syllabus of the statutes and judgments. Now, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19 there. Mm -hmm. And I will give them one heart, mm -hmm. and I will put a new spirit within you. Right. And I will take the stony heart out of the flesh, mm -hmm. and will give them a heart of flesh. Right, there we go. They will be given one heart. That's why Sister White says in any writing chapter, uh, page 50, it says the 144,000 were all united. They were all under the same heart. If you see someone saying, uh, most of going to be part of the one person, uh, who has no unity with others, he is not. Mark my word, he is not. That's how we know. Because once the heart operation is done, the people will be made to be one. Mm -hmm. I will give them one heart. So if it is one and you want to entangle yourself you know, so that you are not to one, you have no spirit which is new, which God has promised, that you will give into the heart. And you will be one with others. Mm -hmm. Now it says, I will give them one heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. you and I will take the stony heart out of, the, out of their flesh. And will give them a heart of flesh. So you find that if you don't have that spirit. And you don't have that heart. No matter how much you can pretend you are now keeping the festivals. It will be proven by the oneness. If the oneness is not found, then you are just playing, acting your part, waiting for someone to take that place that you are still occupying. So here, um, verse 20. Yeah. 20. <coughs> Ezekiel 11. Yeah, 11 verse 20. That, that, mm -hmm. okay. And I will give them one heart, mm -hmm. and I will put a new spirit within you, mm -hmm. and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, mm -hmm. and will give them a heart of flesh, mm -hmm. that they may walk in my statutes, right. and keep my ordinances, mm -hmm. and do them, mm -hmm. and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. So that's why God is clearly saying, the one people thousand were perfectly united, they had one heart. They were walking in the statutes of God. They were comfortable with peace coming from high, from keeping these statutes. They had no issues, no problems amongst themselves. They had one spirit, and that one spirit kept them one. And those who in the, in the Old Testament, I mean, in the, the early Christians, who received this uh, former reign, they were one. They were of one accord. They were together. If they were not together, then they wouldn't receive that spirit. It was only those who were one. 120 of them were one. They received the former. 
And anyone who wanted that same spirit would join with 120. That's why 3,000 people were baptized because of one spirit which was there in all of them. The, the, the Bible clearly says there was no one who would say this thing belongs to another. This is this. So the spirit which comes with the keeping of the festivals, the fruit of that spirit shows oneness. If there is no oneness, then someone is pretending to be keeping this when he's not. Now, um, let's go to Jeremiah. We, we read that verse initially, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. And also maybe we can find it in Patrick's and Prophets 372. Let's go. This shall be. Okay? Let's hear what this covenant is all about. It's got a one spirit, one heart of flesh, not heart. The hard heart is taken off. Right? Mm -hmm. This shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. After those days, mm -hmm. saith the Lord, right? I will put my law in their inward parts right? and write it in their hearts. Mm -hmm. I will forgive their iniquity mm -hmm. and will remember their sin no more. Right. So it means they stop sinning. The next verse tells us that no one will teach the other and say, no, the Lord. So it means when you still need a teacher, to correct you, to tell you where you are wrong, where you are right. You don't have this heart. This heart of flesh, it makes you have no teacher because you know exactly what God wants. You will, know, you will never need any discipline or anything. You, when you still hear, need discipline, it means your heart is hard. It's not yet soft. So God needs to soften that heart. And while it's, I'm afraid, while it's God is trying to soften the heart, some people despair on that point and they lose out. So um, let's go to Patrick's and Prophets, uh, page 372.2. The same law. The same law mm -hmm. that was engraved upon the tables of stone mm -hmm. is written by the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. upon the tables of the heart. Listen, the same law then. Which we say, oh, the law of Moses came with the table of stone, with ten commandments, with this and that. It was on the table of stone, but now it has been transferred to the heart. So if that law is in the heart, you don't need a teacher. You don't need anyone to tell you to, not to be, a, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not this and that. If you still need a teacher to do that, then the heart is still hard. You need a soft heart. You need a soft heart. So I said the same law that was engraved upon the tables of stone is written by the Holy Spirit upon the tables of the heart. That's where it is. So, so many times we, we, we dodge and say this and that and this and that, but when you still need a teacher, the heart is still hard. It needs a teacher. Um, let's hear, instead of going about where you lived, the same law mm -hmm. that was engraved upon the tables of stone mm -hmm. is written by the Holy Spirit upon the tables of the heart. Right. Mm -hmm. instead, of be, instead of going about to establish our own righteousness, we accept the righteousness of Christ. Right. So sometimes you see how we, how, how we behave. We behave in a way we act a law which is not in the heart. Why? Why do I say so? Because if it is in the heart, you don't need someone to teach you. But when it is in the heart, you, it's done by the Holy Spirit. The, the writer is the Holy Spirit writing in my heart. Then when it is like that, um, uh, what we are being told here is that it says, instead of going about to establish our own righteousness, yeah, so many people have their own righteousness, which is not the righteousness coming from God. Because they don't have this heart operation. The heart is so hard. They don't have this heart operation. They need a heart of flesh. But because the heart is hard, what we see and we marvel and think somebody is holy, is very pious, is self-righteousness that we are, we are seeing and beholding. Up until somebody comes up, clearly that the heart had nothing. It was all a drama outside. That's how we identify that the heart operation was not done. So here it says, um, 
Instead, repeat that one. Instead of going about. Instead of going about to establish our own righteousness, mm -hmm. we accept the righteousness of Christ. Right. Let's let's turn our own righteousness mm -hmm. and look for the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ, how does it come? It comes with a heart operation. You don't need anyone to instruct you how to keep the commandments. You know, you don't need how any, anyone to instruct you how to keep the faith because the heart operation was done. If without this operation, then you are just acting righteousness when there is no righteousness. Now here we have to cry for Christ's righteousness, right? And here, his, his blood. His blood atones for our sins. Mm -hmm. His obedience is accepted for us. Mm -hmm. Then the heart renewed by the Holy Spirit will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. Right. So after this height of heart operation, what do we see? We see somebody who is able to forgive one another. Mm. We heard that the lesson last night. It touched me because sometimes we see so we are so hard and full of pride, mm. and we can if we can't even forgive somebody who pleads for forgiveness. You can't. Yeah, because you can't forget. So if you can't forget, then you can't forgive. I saw it last night. Listen, it touched me. So now it says, when then the heart is renewed by the Holy Spirit, and this heart will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Forgiveness. Yeah, forgiveness. Yeah. So many people, so many people break that they are, they are Christians when they are strikers. A striker is, is, is not a Christian. You strike, you, you maintain grudges, you don't forgive. Forget about Christianity because it's, you're just acting it. If you are not acting Christianity, you should be like a child. That's why Christ said, unless you become like a child, you will never enter the kingdom. You will never. In your day-to-day -day life, you should be like a child. What happens to a child? They fight outside there. In two minutes, they are already walking together. That's a child. But if you find yourself, yourself not pardoning anyone, you're not a child. Your spirit is still very hard. And you are not a child. The children, they do so many examples that we adults should adopt and copy. They play with each other, yet they were shouting at each other in, in a minute. And yet they, they were stealing things from each other in a minute. But next they are already, they forgot. They forgive and forget the children. Learn from the children. You see, they teach us day to day. How many times you find children walking together, playing together, while their own parents of the same children are not talking to each other. And then you break and say you are a Christian. Let's forget this name Christianity. And go, the devil knows. He pushes a lot. A lot of people who have gone to limit with him and they know how to pretend to be saints and only when they cannot forgive and forget you find they were not saints so here we want to be saints we want to be following because our heart is now a heart of flesh not a hard heart this comes when we obey the gospel gospel plan for us that's why it says the precepts were given to guard even the Ten Commandments. You can't keep the Ten Commandments without this heart operation. You need the heart operation to keep the Ten Commandments. Now, let's hear more. <laughs> let's hear more from that paragraph. Finish it. His blood <clears throat> atones for our sins. Mm -hmm. His obedience is accepted for us. Mm -hmm. Then the heart renewed by the Holy Spirit will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Through the grace of Christ, we shall live in obedience to the law of God written upon our hearts. Mm -hmm. Having the spirit of Christ, we shall walk even as he walked. Right. So when we follow Christ, let's not fool ourselves that we are following Christ. When we cannot act our part as children. That's why he just grabbed all the children and said, let them come unto me, the kingdom is theirs. Unless you adopt, that's why even in the time of Moses, he had to grab the children, under 20s, and the ones who walked with him. 
the over 20s, they maintain grudges. They don't forgive. They don't forget. They maintain, they, they, you know, they are so, you know, the brain is so hard to be imbued by the spirit. They maintain a status quo which the devil introduces in their heart. But God wants us to adopt the spirit of Christ and be Christians in reality, in principles, walk like him. Now, let's hear, let's hear another one, uh, early writing, page 215. First paragraph. So we can see the gospel plan brings all these heart operations for us to walk in statutes, to walk in the commandments, to walk in all these laws they are written in our heart. And all these fruits of the Spirit will follow. But here we have in early writing, page 215. Let's read from there, uh -huh. from the first paragraph. Satan. Mm -hmm could not hinder the plan of salvation. So this very plan of salvation, yeah. the devil knew about it. And he knew, that's why he inspired the beast in, in the dark ages, to change these times and laws. Because he knew there is a heart operation through these laws. So here he says, but God is saying, he cannot hinder this plan of salvation. Listen to the next sentence. Uh -huh. Jesus was crucified mm -hmm. and rose again the third day. Finish. That, that process only of Jesus dying and rising, he was now a victor. Why? It was for you and me to catch on the plan of salvation, now without the, the devil. You know, the devil wants you not to follow or keep the festivals, wants you not to have this plan of salvation, the gospel. Why? He knows once you do that, he has lost he has lost the person. So here he says, he died. He died actually for you and me to keep the festival. That's the truth of it. Because the devil says, remember in heaven, that these laws are a, God is a tyrant, wants us to continue keeping, in, 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 today some people are skipping, the, some are going, you know, making their, their time anyway. But God is saying, this is a holy convocation. It's a holy convocation. Yeah. If the, you find any law which stops you convocating, God says you sustain a loss. In his times of convocation, you should com convocate. You break the law. When you abstain from convocation, it's a, unless it was a lockdown. And so many people say, oh, lockdown, I was just watching online. I was not. It was pardoned by grace because it was not your fault. But when now the lockdown is finished and you continue that way, you meet the displeasure of God. Now here it says, Satan could not hinder the plan of salvation. Jesus was crucified and rose again the third day for us to keep these holy convocations. Yeah, it's, it's simple. If you don't convocate, you're breaking the convocation. No, that's it. But listen to that. <laughs> but, but Satan told his angels, that he would make the crucifixion and resurrection tell to his advantage. It will tell to his advantage. How? He would stop people convocating. He stops those who, who, who have not the syllabus of the uh, uh, convocation or the festivals. Because the Ten Commandments does not allow us to convocate. It just says rest at home. Mm. Go to the, uh, remember this Sabbath and keep it holy. Six days shall all work be done, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord. You shall do no work. You, your son, your daughter, your stranger, and a visitor, everyone shall rest. There is no way it is written you to go to church. The only law which says you should go to church is the gospel law, Leviticus. That law the devil wants you to break that law of convocation. And you break it willingly. To those who don't have that syllabus of festivals, they, they break it by not heeding to the call of Elijah to keep, to keep the, the festivals. To those also who are already keeping the festivals, they don't sometimes they stay at home instead of for, for uh, convocating. They need also the pleasure, the, the displeasure of God. 
Because the law does not come from a person. The law comes from God. You might keep the Ten Commandments, like it was with Cain. He was a Ten Commandment keeper. But the only law he broke was the Gospel law. And that one is sinning against the Holy Ghost. Now listen to that. It says, uh -huh, he was willing. He was willing mm -hmm. that those who professed faith in Jesus mm -hmm. should believe that the laws regulating the Jewish sacrifices and offerings ceased at the death of Christ. What is he telling people? He's telling people that all that was nailed to the cross. The laws that are regulating the death of Christ or the laws of the festivals, they brought the, rejected the feast. And by so doing, by rejecting the feast, this you are playing to the tune of the devil. He was willing. He wanted to take the, the advantage to the crucifixion of Christ. And how did he want to take that advantage? He was willing that those who profess the faith in Jesus, you see the faith of Jesus is those festivals. The faith in Jesus should believe that laws regulating the Jewish sacrifices and of offerings ceased at the cross. We are not saying after the cross, continue to kill the lamb. Mm -hmm. But after the, after the cross, cross, continue to keep those festivals with the bread and wine. There should be something pointing to the body of Christ, which we take on our Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper should be on the proper time, and also the lamp which was being killed in the Old Testament should be replaced by the bread and wine. So he wants to make sure these laws are not kept. How? By not keeping the festivals. How? By not coming to convocate with others. How? By not having a convocation at all, except one on Sabbath where people say, this is not a feast, this is just going to church, but then you ask them the question, where do you find that law that you go on a Sabbath to church, while at least you are not keeping a feast? There's none. There's none. So it's the plan of the devil. Now here, let's hear, let's hear uh -huh. He was willing that those laws should be, yeah, let's, let's hear more. Mm -hmm. He was willing mm -hmm. that those who professed faith in Jesus mm -hmm. should believe that the laws regulating the Jewish sacrifices and offerings ceased at the death of Christ. How many are believing that? So many believe in that. So many. That's where the catch is. On the plan of salvation, the gospel. Read, read on next sentence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If he could push them further and make them believe that the law of Ten Commandments also died with Christ. We have seen some even condemning those who are keeping the Sabbath and saying even the Sabbath was nailed to the cross. This is all coming from the devil. It is all coming from the devil. What the devil want, does not want is those convocations in Leviticus 23. That's where the main, main gospel is. God says the gospel is not in Leviticus. I don't see it. Where you can keep it without a convocation. I don't see and I don't even understand it. It's an idea from the devil. That's it. And here it says, um, early writing 2.15 there, it says, I saw that many, listen to that. Mm -hmm. I saw mm -hmm. that many readily yielded to this device of Satan. You know, so do many yield to it? Yes. Because the devil present the, the, the gospel in a lazy way. If you say the feasts are nailed to the cross, you're doing nothing. The whole year, you're doing nothing. You're lazy. If you say you can't convocate, you're lazy. It, it, because those who convocate, they are, they are busy. They are busy. Why are you lazy? You know, focus at home, doing nothing. This comes from the devil, whoever you are. It's for the devil. That's the truth of it. The truth of, of God says, convocate. The truth of God says, keep the festivals. The truth from God is still upholding the festivals. But if you have any other way except what is in black and white, it's the devil. This is what wants to take you as far. And listen, it says, when you have admitted that, he will push you further. 
to even saying the Ten Commandments has nailed to the cross. How do you say so? By starting to break the, the Ten Commandments. Then we know even the Ten Commandments to you has been nailed to the cross. Now, let's hear more. Let's hear. Mm -hmm. Right? I saw that many readily yielded. We'll start from that paragraph. I saw that many readily yielded to this device of Satan. Mm -hmm. All heaven was moved with indignation as they saw the holy law of God trampled underfoot. underfoot. How was it trampled underfoot? By people proclaiming it was nailed to the cross. By people pro proclaiming it is not nailed, it's still binding but not even convocating. The same are together. Hmm. But listen, listen to that. Listen, next. Uh -huh. Jesus mm -hmm. and all the heavenly host mm -hmm. were acquainted with the nature of God's law. So God, God, nearly, God clearly knows what he has put in black and white in the Bible. He has introduced complication to people. And there's a reason why. That's why Sister White says, you, you sustain a loss. What is it that you get from, from, from complicating? You read it in Patrick's and Prophet, it will tell you exactly what you get. It is a, a flower in your spiritual life, building it up. Yeah? It's like firewood. When firewood is, is, is together like that, the, the fire is hot with the red flames. But pull one stick up. The, the stick will start producing, you know, smoke all over and disturbing even those, you know, who are in the house because their eyes are now pricked by the smoke. That's what happens when you pull yourself off. But put them together. It will be what? Encouraging one another. What do we get from the convocation? What do we get? Even when you are in distress coming, from, coming to a convocation, the distress goes off. You get people who believe what you believe. We encourage you in, in the walk to the plan of salvation. This is what God, why would you ask God, why did you create convocation? He created convocation so that people who come with different opinions, with different, with different ideas, different stresses, but when they meet on one subject, they all, you know, unite and strengthen each other and move on. This is how we move on as a Christian. But let's hear, let's hear more. Yeah. The hopeless condition of man mm -hmm. after the fall mm -hmm. caused the deepest sorrow mm -hmm. in heaven. Right? Sorry. And? And moved Jesus to offer to die for the transgressors of God's holy law. Right. When this law was broken, the law of the festivals of convocation, this is the law that brought Jesus to die on the cross. So breaking that law... You are actually saying he did not die for you. But listen, listen read more. Yeah. But mm -hmm. if that law could be ab abrogated, mm -hmm. man might have been saved without the death of Christ. Right. If that law has, has to be set aside, hmm. then it means people will just be saved without Christ coming to die on the cross. Right? So... The, by breaking the festivals, you are actually saying the death of Christ was useless. Because people will just be saved without him coming to die on the cross. That's what you are producing. But God had to send his own child to come and die for the festivals. For them to be proclaimed. How do you proclaim them? By coming together. If you don't, then you are saying he, it was not, there was no use for you to come. Let's, let us continue as what we have. But here, let's hear, let's hear more. Mm -hmm. But if the law... But it, if that law could be abrogated, mm -hmm. man might have been saved without the death of Jesus. Right. Consequently, his death did not destroy the law of his father, mm -hmm. but magnified and honored it and enforced obedience to, an, to all its holy precepts. Right. When he died, consequently... His death did not destroy this law. Why, is, why are people telling people that this law was nailed to the cross of the festival? When Christ died, this law was further magnified. It was not destroyed by the cross. It was magnified that we now rejoice keeping that law, enjoying 
hey, the, the sacrifice which was done by our Savior, while he's blessing us, that's the gospel which was given to Moses when he came from Mount Sinai. And for the Israelites to keep, and also those Israelites who come after the cross to enjoy walking in that law. Now, let's hear, let's hear another, another quote, which is very important. Go to P.P. Uh, Patterson Prophets, page 142.1. We are keeping this new covenant, and it does not come without the laws which were given to Moses, which God clearly says in Malachi, remember ye this law which came to Moses with the statutes and judgments and the commandments and the testimonies. It's now written in our heart. But the devil continued to inspire people to tell you that this law was nailed to the cross. Mm -hmm. Then we are told by Sister White that if it was not needed, if it was nailed to the cross, then, and you stop keeping that law, then you are preaching that it was not, not necessary for Christ to come. He actually died to make sure this law is kept in a magnified way. Now, um, let's go to Patrick St. Prophet. Page 142.1. Abraham. Abraham's affection mm -hmm. for his children right. and his household mm -hmm. led him to guard their religious faith, mm -hmm. to impart to them a knowledge of the divine statutes. Right. What we do, Abraham had children and he loved the children that he was given by God. Mm. When you love your child, make sure he keeps the statutes. Make sure his religion is the religion of the statutes and judgment and commandments. It's no point saying you love the children when you stop them worshipping in the convocated, in the appointed times. It's no point. You don't love that child. That child. If you love the child, make sure that child is in the story time is to make sure the child keeps the appointed times. And here it says... Um, Abraham's affection for his children and his household led him to guard their religious faith. How do you guard the religious faith? By making sure even your offspring are keeping what God has given as a charge. And now it says, to impart to them a knowledge of divine statutes as the most precious legacy. How can you keep the children and tell the children that you're supposed to convocate? On Sabbath, you're supposed to convocate on Passover, supposed to convocate on New Moon, while you withhold the child and making sure it does not go for convocation. That's a crazy way of managing a family. You manage a family the way God wants the family to be managed. Amen. You understand? So, so many parents, they run short of that, and they break the law and make sure their children break God's holy law. You understand? But here it says, as the most precious legacy he could transmit to them. You know, I've seen parents having a will or anything where in case I die, my children have this and that. The best will you should have is to make sure your child convocates in the appointed times. That's an, there is no other will better than that one. You understand? Let's hear more. Uh -huh. Abraham's affection mm -hmm. for his children mm -hmm. and his household mm -hmm. led him to guard their religious faith, to impart to them a knowledge of the divine statutes mm -hmm. as the most precious legacy mm -hmm. he could transmit to, to them, them and right? through them to the world. Right. All were taught that they were under the rule of God in That's heaven. That's what Abraham taught his own children. They were taught... You are all under the rule of God. Which rule? Of keeping his statutes, of keeping his commandments, of convocating. You introduce the children not to convocate, you have introduced the devil in your own family. But here, let me tell you one thing. The legacy that you can leave for your own child is the legacy of making sure the child convocates. The child keeps all the commandments, Statutes, judgments. There is no other will better than that. But here he says, it is the rule of the God of heaven. Yeah? And there was... There was to be no oppression 
on the part of parents and no disobedience on the part of children. Right. On this law only of convocation, there should be no oppression from parents. I see some parents, they stop children going to Sabbath. They stop children going to a feast. They stop children going to, they, you know, they're acting the other way, the other way. This is an oppressive way, which is God, God is saying. There was to be no oppression on the part of parents. So parents, when God said to Abraham, I know that Abraham is going to instruct his family. This is what he meant. He meant that Abraham is going to introduce this type of worship to his children. And that is a legacy. He was going to give his own family. That's why we have the 12 tribes still keeping the statues, still convocating because that was a legacy coming from their father, Abraham. But we have some foolish fathers who do not think ahead what will happen to their children ahead when they are dead or when they are uh, you know, quite old. What manner of child are you bringing up? What manner of child is that who you don't introduce to the true worship of God? That's why so many parents will cry and say, my child doesn't want to worship. My child, they did not do their part. Do your part and make sure and leave the results with God. You do your part. You see, parents, we have a lot to learn from Abraham. But let's hear, let's hear more. him. God's law had appointed to each his duties, mm -hmm. and only in obedience to it could any secure happiness or prosperity. In obedience to this law only. That's the only way to get what is called happiness, happiness on earth. Without the law of convocation, there is no happiness. Don't pretend to be happy. There is no happiness. I, I get that happiness when I meet others and we talk about the same faith and enjoying, we come together, and that's the reason why God has made a convocation part of our laws. It is our laws because he knows that's what will strengthen us in, Christian, in Christianity. But don't tell me the other way around. It's the devil who promises you another happiness beside this one. But here, let's hear, let's hear, it says um, in 143.1, mm -hmm. the light is still the light esteem mm -hmm. in which the law of God is held, mm -hmm. even by religious leaders, Listen to that. has been productive of great evil. This is the production of great evil by lightly, lightly esteeming this system which God introduced. This is how evil comes. Yeah? How evil comes. You stop complicating. You have no control of the consequences. That will come, and God will open them. It has to be done the way he has designed. Unless it is followed, then there is no happiness, and there will be serious consequences. But here he says, um, the teaching. The, the teaching, teaching. Uh -huh. which has become so widespread that the divine statutes are no longer binding upon men is the same as idolatry. That's clear in what is called upon idolatry. That's an idolatrous way of living without convocation. That's an idolatry. The the teaching that which has become so widespread. Is it widespread? Yes. Everybody, oh it's just done away. Oh it, this is what God calls idolatry. Idol worshiping. If this way of worshiping God has been shut down if it, it has been taken off from your life, then you are worshipping idols. Now listen, listen to that. <laughs> Those who seek to lessen the claims of God's holy law are striking directly at the foundation of the government of families and nations. Right. Where are we? Where are we going? If this law of convocation of festivals has been shunned in our life, where are we striking? We have to, taken our guns straight to the government of the families. What is a family? A family follows what God has prescribed. The law of statutes and judgments, how they are kept. That's God's government. But 
by shunning that system the Ghana has been turned to the government of God, huh? of the families. But let's see, let's see what happens more. Religious parents right? failing to walk in the statutes mm -hmm. do not command their household to keep the way of the Lord. They are not commanding. Yeah, because when the child was, you know, let's I take an example when just a Sabbath, and then say, I'm not going to convocate. I'm staying at my home. What are you doing to your parents? What are you doing to your parents? I mean, to your, to your children. What is What type of a parent is this one? This is the parent God is talking about here. It says religious parents failing, failing to walk in his statutes. In the statutes, read read that one again. Religious parents failing to walk in his statutes uh -huh. do not command their household to keep the way of the Lord. They do not command the household to keep the way of the Lord. The when they fail to worship God accordingly, they have stopped following God. The law of God mm -hmm. is not made the rule of life. They have taken the law of God out of their life. Yeah? Let's go. The children, mm -hmm. as they make homes of their own, mm -hmm. feel under no obligation to teach their children what they themselves have never been taught. Ah, so, for example, when you when somebody say today I'm not going, uh, are you ill? I, I'm not ill. I, I want, I'm not everything. And the child is watching you. You are teaching him that you can stay home if you want. True. And that is killing the family life which came from the foundation of God's government. You teach your children to be against God. You give a case which is inherited by your children. Now listen, that's why sometimes when, when someone wants to decide to come back to church, and he, he comes back and leaves the children, the children say, where are we going now? If we allow that time to stay home, where are, now? where are we going now? You taught the child the wrong way of doing things in life. But here, let's hear. Mm -hmm. The, the children, children mm -hmm. as they make homes of now their own. Now as they go and make their own homes, yeah? Feel under no obligation to teach their children what they themselves have never been taught. Right. What are they going to teach their own children when they are in their homes? That there is a time my parents also accommodated staying home on a Sabbath there. So what should the parents do? Teach the children that this is not their law, it's the law of God. Finish. No exceptions. No other. It's our duty as parents to teach our children to worship God. If we teach them other lessons, that's why when they are alone, you see them doing other things that they want because they were taught at home to do that. Listen to that. <laughs> And mm -hmm. this is why there are so many godless families. That's why now, this is from why. your own children, you created what is called godless families. The godless families, they fall. Why? Because a parent did not know his duty that God is watching and thinking that this one, let me give this one children, but that person was a, a dog which became a, a dumb dog, no barking. To, to his children. Right? Listen. Uh -huh. This is why mm -hmm. depravity is so deep and widespread. Mm -hmm. Right? So what is depravity? So deep and widespread. Who started it? It roots back to the person who started. And God knows. Right? Let's hear, let's hear more. This is an interesting subject which go together with us now in the, in the new covenant. How we misfire. While he's claiming we are in the new covenant, we misfire some of the things. But let's see, let's let's hear from another quote next day. What do IGC 88 space 582.1? I know it is in the new Easter and it's a bit long, but we, we see we can go halfway if we want, or we can finish it when God permits. In seeking to cast contempt, that's what I want. Mm -hmm. In seeking to cast contempt upon the divine statutes, mm -hmm. 
Satan has perverted the doctrines of the Bible. This is where he has gone to make sure people come up with what is called church manual, church policy. And in their policies, he made sure they do not attach the statutes. Why? He will know that all these families will be saved if the statutes are there in the, in the church manual. So he, the devil, makes, in seeking to cast contempt upon divine statutes, Satan has perverted the doctrines of the Bible. That's why you see different doctrines here and there, different. Why? He is perverted so that you don't hit at the Gospel Commission. The Gospel is the one in Leviticus 23. This is what we have been taught. So he makes sure when you make your policies, they don't have these divine statutes. So he knows you are, you are just playing around with the families who are now thinking they are worshipping. But they don't have the syllabus to worship God. Now listen to that. Uh -huh. In seeking to cast contempt upon the divine statutes, mm -hmm. Satan had, has perverted the doctrines of the Bible mm -hmm. and errors have thus become incorporated in, into the faith of thousands who profess to believe the scriptures. Right. So how many profess to believe the scriptures? Thousands. But here it says, Satan has perverted the doctrines of the Bible. And errors have thus become incorporated into the faith of thousands who profess to believe the scriptures. The last great conflict, let's hear that sentence. Listen to the last great conflict. The last great conflict between truth and error is but the final struggle of the long-standing controversy concerning the law of God. Not the last great struggle, but which law do you think the devil uses? He does not care about the Ten Commandments. You can keep it. But he knows you can't keep the Ten Commandments without the convocation law. The convocation law is the one that is the gospel, the festivals. So he makes sure he perverts the festivals so that no one will keep the festivals but claim to keep the Ten Commandments. Now let's see, let's hear more. <laughs> this is a long-standing controversy. Even in heaven, that was the controversy. Uh -huh. The uh, last... Upon this battle. Upon this battle, mm -hmm. we are now entering a battle between the laws of men and the precepts of Jehovah. Right. The, the, the battle now is, when you are told about the Feast of Tabernacle, the laws of men will tell you to keep it anyhow, anytime, any place. While the laws of God are straightforward with the dates, straightforward with the place, straightforward with how it is kept. When God will tell you about the Lord's Supper, the laws of men will tell you take the supper any time in the afternoon, in the day. But God's law in the Bible is straightforward with the date and the time and the place. You understand? So the battle that we have now is between the law of God and the law of men. So it's up to you now to see what, what you are following. Is it the law of men or is the law of God? The law of God, of course, is there in the Bible, straightforward. You don't do the law and do the testimony. It is there clearly. If it is not according to the Bible, it's all wrong. Now listen to that. That's the battle, that's the last conflict the devil has now. Listen to that. Mm -hmm. Right, next sentence. Upon this battle, Upon this battle mm -hmm. we are now entering. Mm -hmm. A battle between the laws of men and the precepts of Jehovah. Mm -hmm. Between the religion of the Bible and the religion of fable and tradition. So there's two religions now. You find everywhere, you, you, find, you find two people. One who keeps the religion of the Bible and the other keeping the religion of the tradition of men. So it all depends what you put on your table. Your table, if you want to follow the religion, the tra tradition of men, or the, tra the religion in the Bible, it's up to you. It's a choice. You know, salvation is just merely a choice. Whatever you do, have a thus say the Lord. If there is no thus say the Lord, it's all false. It's wrong. Now listen to that. Uh -huh. The deceived. To deceive men. To deceive men mm -hmm. and thus lead them 
to transgress God's law is the object which he has steadfastly pursued. This is what the devil wants. He will deceive men on changing the system of God's worship. If God wants to be worshipped by coming together, he will tell you not to come together because of this reason and that reason and that, that you think is valid in front of God. But when God said it, he said once, he knows there are plenty, pretty, plenty reasons to stop you, but he says once. The convocation is what he wants. Right? And listen. Mm -hmm. Whether this be accomplished by casting aside the law altogether mm -hmm. or by rejecting one of its precepts, mm -hmm. the result will be untimely the same. Right. The result is still the same. If you say, uh, I don't want to keep the Sabbath, yeah? Or I want to keep the Sabbath but still cannot keep it with convocation, what God has said. The results are just the same. Now listen to that. <laughs> He that offends in one point mm -hmm. manifests contempt for the whole law. When you broke, break one principle in the system of the law, you have broken the whole law. The whole law. Unless you break without knowing. When you know, you break the whole law. Oh, what a, what a waste of time. And then listen to that. Uh -huh. He that offends in one point Manifest contempt for the whole law. Mm -hmm. His influence and example are on the side of transgression. Mm -hmm. He becomes guilty, guilty of all. As, as guilty as all are guilty. Right, listen to that. Many, Many mm -hmm. have come to deny doctrines which are the very pillars of Christian faith. Mm -hmm. The great facts of creation as presented by the inspired writers, the fall of man, the atonement, and the perpetuity of the law of God are practically rejected, right. either wholly mm -hmm. or in part, mm -hmm. by a large share of professedly Christian world. Mm -hmm. Thousands. Thousands mm. who pride themselves upon their wisdom and independence regard it an evidence of weakness to place implicit confidence in the Bible. Mm -hmm. They think it a proof of superior talent and learning to cavil at the scriptures and to spiritualize and explain away their most important truths. Mm -hmm. Many ministers. Many ministers are teaching their people, and many professors and teachers are instructing their students mm -hmm. that the law of God has been changed or abrogated, mm -hmm. and those who regard its requirements as still valid to be literally obeyed are thought to be deserving only of ridicule or contempt. This is what the devil is educating everyone. Why is God wants his laws kept according to how he has prescribed in the Bible? And when he says in Leviticus chapter 23, from Sabbath, Passover, New Moon, Pentecost, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacle, these are convocations. He's not mentioning that in part. He wants it fully done, and it's a law, and it's a gospel plan. And you go far from what God has, has designed, you actually have shunned the way of the Lord. And you are just as guilty as the one who said, let me not touch any, let me just enjoy myself in the world. You are just the same. This is what I'm learning from the scripture. But if anyone has an ear, let him hear what the word says to our ears so that we are saved. Here it says in, on Review and Herald today, the December 26, 1907. Uh -huh. The Lord's purposes uh -huh. for his people have ever been the same. The purpose of God for his people, whether they are in Old Testament or in New Testament, is all the same. The covenant whether the old or the new, it still got the same laws and the purpose of God is similar. If he took the Israelites out of Egypt so that they can start convocating on those convocation days, he had the same purpose of making them a holy people. 
And in the New Testament, it is still giving the festivals and people to worship on those convocation day with still the same purpose of making the people a holy people. So it's up to you to toss around with your salvation. It's up to you because salvation is a choice. And if you choose to walk with, the, with God, you will enjoy. We choose to walk with the devil, you will have a troubled life. This is what I learned from the Bible. The Deuteronomy chapter 28 will tell you clearly, if you stop worshiping God, if you stop keeping his convocation, if you stop keeping his laws, these all will come and overtake you. All these cases, he clearly says them one by one. But this year, mm -hmm, he desires. He desires to bestow on the children of men the riches of an eternal inheritance. Right. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Mm -hmm. When those who choose to become obedient subjects of the Most High are finally saved in the kingdom That's of God. That's what he's looking for. In the kingdom, those who lived in the Old Testament and those who lived in the New Testament will all find themselves together. Why? Because they were given the same syllabus, the same laws. This is what they we kept them as saints. They will sit together. Don't point at the laws and say these were for those in the Old Testament as if we have different laws. We have the same. And we will stay in the same heaven, in the same kingdom, worshipping the same God, in the same way we have been given. Do you understand? So here, let's hear, finish that paragraph so we can conclude. When those who choose to become obedient subjects of the Most High and finally are finally saved in the kingdom of glory, God's purpose for mankind will have been fulfilled. That's it. That's the aim of God, to make sure those who lived in the old and those who live in the new obey as precept and example has been demonstrated in the Bible. And this is what we are all aiming at, so that we are saved and we attain the best motive why God gave us all these laws so that the motive was to make us holy people, to make us stay and be saved. You can't be saved anywhere else without the gospel. The gospel is there to us. Let's hear it. To us. To us who are praying and longing for the coming of, the, of this most glorious kingdom, as well as the children of Israel in the days of Zechariah, are spoken the words, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For lo, I come and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, mm -hmm. and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. Mm -hmm. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion, in the holy land, mm -hmm. and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Right. So this gospel is the one that will take the sheep to the right and the goats to the, to the left. It's because of the gospel which has been proclaimed by Elijah to the people who are now being fitted for the kingdom. And those who want tally, those who want go with the, with the gospel commission will lose out as gods. You and I cannot afford to lose our time and waste our time so that we are not found in the kingdom. When the syllabus is so clear, God has given a clear syllabus for those who want to enjoy walking in the new covenant. This is how God has prescribed it and this is how it should be followed. If life is a choice, what you choose is what God will follow. Are you going to be in the left or in the right? Are you going to be a sheep to the right or a goat to the left? May God bless you.